Moderator for our next discussion, Wall Street Journal reporter Vivian Salama. Good morning, everyone. It is so great to be with you all. Um, and thanks to the Truman Center and everyone for having us um, for this very, very important discussion. We are going to be talking about chips. Sadly, not about potato chips, my favorite topic, but another topic I love, which is the Bipartisan Chips and Science Act, which focuses on the creation of incentive to produce semiconductors in the United States, committing the nation not only to compete with China and others, but also uh, enhancing industrial policy and talent, advancing national security goals, um, and enhancing uh, manufacturing pr productivity and economic uh, inclusion. And so, obviously, a very, very important topic, a very timely topic, and here to unravel it all, um, this very distinguished panel with me, um, we have Jordan Blaschek, who is the president and co-founder of America's Frontier Fund, where he oversees the vision, strategy, and investments of the organization. Great to see you. Um, to my left, Morgan Dwyer, Chief Strategy Officer for the CHIPS Program Office. She joined the CHIPS Program Office um, at the White House Office of Science and Technology, where she leads the National Security Division. And finally, Dr. Anne-Marie Slaughter, the CEO of New America. Uh, Anne-Marie uh, is also the Bert G. Kerstetter, um, 66 University Professor Emerita uh, of Politics and International Affairs. Um, and I deleted it. At Princeton, that's, I, that's what I thought. This is what happens when I try to rely on technology, folks, and this is why I need these very important people with me to explain why I cannot uh, keep my notes in order. Um, and of course, she uh, has held uh, senior roles at the State Department, including Director for Policy and Planning uh, there, and she was the first woman to hold that position, which we love. So thank you all for being here. Um, so let's just dive right in. Um, Morgan, I'm going to start with you because U.S. efforts to accelerate American semiconductor technology and production um, obviously very much underway. And I want you to explain to us a little bit about how the CHIP Act intends to increase domestic chip production in the U.S., the timeline, the impact. Just give us a little bit of a, a layout. Sure. So first of all, thanks uh, for having us here. Really excited for the opportunity to talk about CHIPS. Um, so as I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, President Biden signed the Chips and Science Act into law in August. And we have been moving full speed ahead at the Commerce Department ever since. Uh, so first thing you've got to do in implementing uh, legislation is you've got to build a great team. Uh, we have uh, spent a lot of time recruiting tremendous talent to help us get the job done. Uh, we're almost 100 people strong at the CHIPS program office. Um, within the first six months after the bill was passed, we released our first notice of funding opportunity. Um, that notice of funding opportunity is for uh, what we call chip manufacturing facilities or FABs, fabrication facilities. These are the big manufacturing facilities that are going to produce chips. Um, we began accepting applications for what we call leading edge fabrication facilities on March 31st. Uh, those are applications for producers of the most advanced chips. Uh, we're going to begin accepting applications for what we call current and mature uh, facilities starting on June 26th. And right now we're accepting what we call pre-applications for both leading edge and current and mature chip facilities. The pre-application process is an opportunity for applicants to submit sort of an abridged version of their application and get feedback from the CHIPS program office. We've really set up a unique, sort of a one-of-a-kind government operation that's really iterative with the private sector. And so the pre-application process provides an opportunity for us to review materials and provide feedback before folks move into full applications. You know, like with all great things, there are challenges, obviously. Um, there have been countless announcements over the past 18 months or so about companies investing in new chip factories or fabs. Uh, Intel's $20 billion factory in Ohio, TSMC, said it would spend upward of $44 billion um, this uh, last year, the last calendar year. Samsung is, um, you know, ramping up its own, its own activities. Um, these domestic factories should presumably help break the supply chain bottlenecks, but it takes time to build these factories. It takes time for these uh, investments to really manifest themselves. And so Jordan and Anne-Marie, you know, what are some of the challenges um, before us and, and how can the industry sort of um, 
circumvent those challenges to, to get America really leading in this industry? Okay, um, great question. Uh, I think the, the CHIPS Act did something incredible, which was it galvanized the semiconductor companies across the United States to really accelerate plans to build new facilities, to double down on different kinds of R&D and technologies, um, and in a lot of ways to, to collaborate in ways they, they haven't always done before. Uh, it's, it's really catalyzed this effort to build coalitions, to think about how we can build ecosystems around these companies and reshore a lot of the supply chain that we've offshored over the last 30 years. Um, but there are also challenges there. So one major challenge is on the talent side. The semiconductor workforce in the United States um, is a majority over 40, uh, so a lot of young people are not going into the semiconductor industry. Um, there's uh, an R&D challenge where it's very difficult to get R&D from the labs into uh, fabrication, so it's just so costly to start a new chip, chip startup today. Um, you have to spend millions of dollars just to get a prototype. Very few investors want to underwrite that process. Um, so there's a challenge on the R&D side. Why is and, it such a challenge to underwrite? Why? I mean, it's, it's a leading <coughs> industry right now. Everyone's talking about it. So why is it such a challenge? Uh, two main reasons. One, in venture capital, you, you typically want to get a return after three to five years. If you're going to pour tens of millions of dollars into building a prototype and the timeline to actually see returns is longer than that three to five year time frame, no investor wants, wants to go into that sector. So it's just very unlikely that a venture capitalist would underwrite that kind of risk. Um, there's also very few customers. So once you build your chip startup, you're really selling to maybe like five to 10 customers, which means there's, there's very little market for you. You're not gonna be able to, to have pricing power um, against that small uh, group of customers. Um, and so it's just not a good market to sell into. And then the last challenge is uh, all these big capital intensive projects like these big fabs, they're gonna take a couple years to build. And then once they start production, the world might look different. And so you're, you're trying to predict into the future what the demand might be for your product at a time when the technology might shift. And so there's just a lot of challenge in terms of that sort of long-term industrial planning. Um, and that, that's, a, that's an issue sort of unique to the, the semiconductor industry. How do you then become a leader? Um, you know, that, I mean, this is what it's about, right, Amory? Like, the US is trying to become a leader in this industry. There's so many challenges right there. I mean, everything is changing. The technologies are changing weeks, months, you know, out. How, how do you then, uh, you know, dominate? So thanks. And first of all, I just have to say I'm, I'm thrilled to be back at TrueCon. I don't think I've been at this particular conference maybe for a decade, but I've been connected uh, to Truman from the very beginning. And it's, just, it's great to see all of you here. And it's also great to see you under such spectacular leadership. Jenna's just... Uh, done a fabulous job, so I'm, I'm just delighted to be here. And I have to just start also by complimenting Morgan on how fast you've done that. I mean, I, you know, you appropriate the money, but actually spending it and getting the, you know, getting it moving through the bureaucracy so that that uh, companies can apply. I'm just listening to you, thinking that's really fast, <laughs> and it's important because obviously we've got to get the money out there. Uh, the other obstacle, uh, another big obstacle, not the other, but another huge obstacle when we look at workforce is childcare, is the fact that we, we, in the construction industry and certainly in this kind of a workforce, you've, you've, we've, we're seeing problems across the board because people, particularly women, but not only by any means, do not have the ability to actually put their kids, afford childcare, right? Childcare for two kids is more than the cost of rent in all 50 states. Now think about that for a minute. And many of you are probably parents and you know. And even if you have the money, then you can't find the facilities. So one of the things uh, that Commerce has done uh, is to say that for grants for over $150 million for some companies, you can correct me, um, you have to provide childcare facilities on site. This is also happening in Oregon, in the construction industry, uh, for the same reason. They can't actually recruit enough construction workers. So one of the things we have to do if we are going to be a leader is actually the other side of the Biden in, uh, infrastructure plan, right? We got chips through, we got the infrastructure bill through, we got the IRA through. What didn't we get through? Build Back Better. We did not get any of the care side 
of infrastructure through. And I would argue if we really want to be a leader, not just in chips, but more broadly, we need a well-educated, cared for, uh, workforce where you can care for your children and your elders and the people who need it, uh, and also work. And I would tie that, and this is also important for us to, as, as leaders, we should be leading with the most diverse, advanced workforce in the world. That's a huge uh, asset for us globally to see, you know, not Rosie the Riveter back in 1943, but Rosie the Riveter today and Rosie the Riveter in, it reflected in, with all the diversity of our population. So one of the, the big challenges really is we've got the, the money for what our manufacturing workforce looked like circa 1950, 1980. It's not what it looks like today, and we're not, we're not building the kind of infrastructure that enables us to educate and employ and retain that workforce. So certainly an issue in so many industries. Um, and and you, you touched upon how extraordinary the funding came together and the entire chips that came together, uh, you know, uh, initially. Um, certainly the money um, that was appropriated was historic and it was something that's been talked about, but you know, we are now coming to the end of the debt ceiling drama and there was a lot of talk about um, cuts to, um, to so-called non-defense discretionary funding, which includes scientific research um, for the 2024 fiscal year. And so, um, Morgan, I'll start with you and I want to hear from everyone. How, how is that going to impact what we are talking about here today, trying to be a leader? in this industry, trying to compete with our adversaries, particularly China, if the scientific element is um, somehow impacted? Yeah, it's a great question. So the, the, what I would highlight for folks is that in, in the CHIPS Act appropriation, it's about 52 billion that's appropriated. Uh, 39, about 39 billion of that goes to manufacturing incentives. Uh, that's the side of the CHIPS program that I work on. About 11 billion goes specifically to R&D to address those challenges that you're talking about. Because it's not just about building manufacturing capabilities today, we also have to make sure that we're able to innovate uh, in manufacturing. And so that is about making sure that we fund R&D in the United States and really create what we like to talk about on CHIPS as sort of these virtuous clusters and cycles of innovation and manufacturing where the R&D and the manufacturing are working together to create the next generation of, of productivity um, and economic growth in the US. So it's critically important. We're thankful that on, on CHIPS, we have a really significant uh, part of the CHIPS Act that was, was dedicated exactly to that. And so in impacting funding to the end science part, you know, uh, do, you, do you feel that this somehow would um, counterbalance what they're trying to do? I don't know if it'll have that big of an effect in the okay. short term. I, I think that the biggest consequence of it is that it makes us seem unpredictable to, to friends and allies around the world. So one of the big things we need to do if we're going to be successful in the long term is work with the allies so that we don't have to do everything domestically. We can use their supply chains. We can use their talent, their technology. Um, but when they're not sure what's going to happen in the United States, it makes them reconsider. Uh, the kind of relationships they want to have with us. So I think that's a big long-term challenge. How do we give predictability to an industry that thinks in 10, 20-year timeframes? So I think that's, that's kind of first and foremost. I think the other is, um, you know, Secretary Raimondo set out a goal of, of leveraging all the CHIPS Act money 10 to 1 with private capital. So how do you get the broader capital markets to invest into America, invest in the semiconductor industry? And again, I think the unpredictability about uh, government funding makes the private sector a little bit less sure of where they want to put their investments. And so I think the, um, the real key for us long term is to make it seem and to make it true that investing in America is better than investing anywhere else and that investing in the American semiconductor industry um, will produce the highest return on investment of anywhere in the world. And there are a lot of ways we can do that. I think the, the investments into talent are really important, into our infrastructure is really important, but also creating an environment where um, it's, it's great for innovation, for investment, and um, long-term uh, productivity to, to be investing here. And again, I think all of that is way more important than just the, the direct federal spending. Um, and, and that's where I, I, I would say we should spend a lot of our time is thinking about how we make America the best place to invest in the world. 
I'd just add that we're, we're coming to the end of graduation season. Mm -hmm. uh, many of you have probably been at some university. I just watched my son graduate. We're almost off the family payroll, but we're, we're getting there. Uh, but it's really striking. And when I was dean of the School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton, I used to participate in the hooding of, of our graduate students. And that meant I would watch all the engineering students cross the, you know, cross the dais and, and get hooded. And that was even 15 years ago in electrical engineering and computer science. The number of Asian students, East Asian students, South Asian students, was very noticeable. I mean, really, they were, that was the majority. So as we think about this science funding, again, if we're thinking about Truman, if we're thinking about the 40s, we're thinking about building up what became the military industrial complex, but also that uh, infusion of defense investment that then powered so much of, of what became consumer investment, you have to build that through our universities. And that does require stable funding, but it also requires stable visa policies. Uh, and visa policies that then enable people to stay. And it requires that we not you know, investigate many of our Chinese students uh, and create an environment uh, in which our students feel, and students from around the world, from our allies, but also from, from the global south uh, and from around the world, feel like America is a destination that is welcoming and that we will then integrate them. Doesn't mean, of course, we don't, we're not careful, uh, but that's a really big piece of our long-term security that, again, we, d we, we don't always sync up with the funding. Beyond just, um, you know, the element there with foreign students, do you think that um, universities across the board, not just the Ivies, not just the technical like MITs of the world, do you think our universities are really um, uh, uh, investing enough in uh, enhancing these skills among our young people so that they can take on the world? They're trying. Um, and again, this, I mean, you know, Stanford got, just created a $1.2 billion dollar uh, school of sustainability, right? The 1.2 billion just from John Doerr, speaking of venture capital, and then lots of other gifts. Now, yeah, that's important. That's, that's as big as even the best universities can get, but that's pocket change in, term, in, in, in comparison to what you need to build this long-term infrastructure. So there are two problems. One, the universities really do need consistent federal funding, but Two, and this, this is a broader question for all of you, that school is not re directly related to chips manufacturing. It's where students want to go today, and they are much more thinking about things like sustainability, the environment, diversity, purpose. So you, you also have to, to sort of broaden out, here's the kind of education you need, and here are all the ways you can use it if you want the kind of students who are gonna have this kind of training and build our infrastructure over coming decades. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I wanna shift a little bit because we're talking about national security ultimately, and so I wanna really um, dig into how the CHIPS Act and how, in general, what we're talking about relates to national security. And so we're going to maybe just start with an overview about how the, the Biden administration thinks that tech will a, transform America by, let's say, 2030, and also how it's tied to its national security goals specifically. Um, ha happy to. One thing that I want to just build off, just to, to point on, you know, I think you're absolutely right. CHIPS is about economic and national security. If we cannot build and operate these facilities in America, if we don't have the workforce to do that, we won't succeed at our goals. So just want to foot stomp everything that has been said here about the criticality of the workforce and really the need for really a whole of society approach to dealing with our workforce challenges. That includes universities, that includes partnerships with community colleges and yes. apprenticeships sure. as well. You know, we're going to create tens of thousands of manufacturing jobs. 60% of the jobs in fabs don't require a college degree. So it is about a broader set of educational partnerships that we really are looking forward to fostering uh, in CHIPS. Labor costs and salaries and all the other issues that come into play, of course. Totally. 
So on, on the national security piece, I'll, I'll keep it high level and, and then turn it over to our, my colleagues to, to chat a little bit more about it. I think about it in a couple of ways. I mean, the biggest, the biggest issue that we're trying to tackle, you mentioned this before, is global supply chain security. A couple of stats uh, that are, I think, really important to keep in mind is in 1990, 37% of global chip capacity uh, was produced in the United States. Today, that number is less than 10%. Um, the U.S. used to produce the majority of advanced logic chips. These are the chips that are really important for emerging technologies like AI and biotech and supercomputers. Uh, today, 92% of those advanced logic chips are produced in East Asia. So why is that a national security challenge? Uh, it's a challenge because our supply chains are not resilient. So if you have a cyber attack or an earthquake or a pandemic, you see disruptions in supply chains. And those supply chains, those disruptions, affect the lives of everyday Americans. I mean, in 2021, uh, the chip shortage caused car prices to go up such that cars contributed to about a third of inflation. That is an economic security challenge that affects all Americans, and so that's really what we're looking to tackle on chips. I mean, you know, Morgan mentions the the the, the drama with the auto industry during COVID, uh, but th these issues obviously have been building over time. COVID just really kind of forced everybody to swallow the hard pill and see that this is something that we have to address. From uh, Jordan and Amory, like. Where do we stand? Have we started to address it enough? We're talking about the Chips and Science Act, but in reality, are we doing enough in real time to avoid a crisis like what we saw in 2020? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, in terms of national security, I, I think it actually it falls into two buckets, yeah. um, one, one of which Morgan described really well. Um, you know, on the one hand, you have the supply chains. And the more leadership we see in the semiconductor industry overseas, the less um, secure we are. We're more dependent on other nations. And in the same way that we could shut off chips to Russia when they invaded Ukraine, in the future, that sort of leverage could be used against us. And microchips are in everything. So it, it is a very fundamental issue dealing with the supply chain. On that front, if you pull apart the value chain, the US used to dominate almost every aspect of it. Today, our leadership has really dwindled to just a few parts, like capital equipment and design. And even those are at risk. If you look at where China has been investing a lot of their venture capital, it is into the design portion of the ecosystem. And in the US, we basically have two incumbents who, who dominate that sector. So we are at risk of losing even more parts of the supply chain, of the value chain. Uh, to competitors. So those are all areas that we really need to double down and ensure that we are doing the things today that will lead to U.S. leadership in those parts of the supply chain 10, 20 years from now. The, the other part is essentially the innovation wars. So uh, as Morgan said, you know, semiconductors are critical to every other technology innovation. So advances in artificial intelligence, quantum computing, all of these are dependent on semiconductors. And innovations in one kind of lead to innovation in the other. And we need to accelerate our own innovation cycles um, in those areas. So um, I think what's really critical for the United States over the next few years is, is to rebuild our innovation ecosystem in, in the semiconductor industry. Again, today, very few entrepreneurs want to go there because they don't see it as, as viable. So what are the things we can do to increase um, entrepreneurs going into that area? I think we can build more shared infrastructure. We can make it easier to go from idea to prototype. We can incentivize venture capital to go into that sector. And the more innovation we have there, I think the more it translates into all these other areas, um, which give us qualitative leadership, not just uh, resiliency. And so, um, you know, if, if I if I have kind of one suggestion, it's it's to figure out how we build back those innovation ecosystems across America for the semiconductor industry. What what can the administration do to help the private sector kind of um, you know work with us, <laughs> work, you know work for them to to really be able to accomplish its goals, the administration's goals more more efficiently, more quickly. I mean, Jordan. Well, I, I think I think one answer there is um, you know as as Morgan was saying, the, these funding opportunities are great opportunities to encourage industry to do more to support those innovation ecosystems. So rather than just build their fab, maybe they can build in specific lines so that entrepreneurs have access to it more, uh, more cheaply. Um, you know, that, that would be one, one answer. Uh, another is to use some of the R&D funding from, from the 11 billion in the CHIPS Act to really support entrepreneurship and make sure that there's de-risking capital to go from kind of initial idea to, to first prototype. 
Um, and then lastly, I think the universities have a major role to play here in building a shared infrastructure and shared computing resources that entrepreneurs can use so they don't have to use their scarce dollars that they get from investors um, in order to just get the very basic uh, you know, infrastructure to, to build a prototype. So I think th those are all things that can be encouraged or catalyzed by, by the government and by universities. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd answer this question specifically and then try to really broaden the conversation. I think what, what Morgan said about community colleges and apprenticeships is hugely important. You know, all the top universities that many of you came from are, again, even the big state engineering schools, the Purdue, the Illinois, the Michigan, even there, that is only a very small slice of you know where the 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 workforce that we need is coming from the the move to shift from pedigree to performance to hiring people based on their skills is hugely important and gov governors across the country are beginning to adopt uh policies uh that in that that drop the 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 kind of you must have a college degree it's it's you you, you ought to be able to be to get a job based on whether you can do the job not on where you went so community colleges <laughs> Community colleges are, are critical. So are places like Metropolitan State in, in you know, the, te the various technical colleges of different kinds, uh, connecting those to industry, connecting them to what we call youth apprenticeships, where you, you get an apprenticeship your junior year in high school and you get paid to learn, right? You're, 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 on, a, you're on a job, you're paid. Uh, your high school coordinates with the company that's hired you and here's what's critical, that's a three-year apprenticeship and it gets you over that, the transition from high school to often nothing, right? Not a good job, maybe a, a, a minimum wage job. This gets you through and into community college and you can go on from there. Gavin Newsom committed to creating half a million of these kinds of apprenticeships. We need much more of that and much more innovation with lots of different kinds of educational institutions, and of course now with hybrid learning in all sorts of ways. One more point there, Arizona State University, Michael Crow committed uh, to, the, he said, look, we are going to admit people at scale, right, it's a 120,000 student university, in the, according to the demography of Arizona, right, we are going to take people to reflect the demography of Arizona and we're gonna be a great research university at the same time. And people laughed at him, and yesterday, Arizona State was admitted into the American Association of uh, University, American Universities Association. Those are the top research institutions. So the big state institutions, not the bottom, can play a huge, huge role. Um, so all of that, I do think, is, is critical, and thinking about how you take one of these fabs, how this investment, can build an educational entrepreneurial ecosystem where they are well beyond just here's the factory and here's the workers. That's again a very 20th century, a mid 20th century view of the American workforce and the whole care infrastructure around that. But I wanna push you to think much more broadly because the Biden national security strategy issued in October was a historic document and not because of this kind of industrial policy. It was a historic document because it said, yes, we've got all these challenges with China and Russia and North Korea and Iran. And then it said, and here are these transnational challenges, climate change, infectious disease, energy shortages, food shortages, inflation. Those challenges, they call them transnational, I call them global, doesn't matter. Those challenges are just as important as the geopolitics. Well, you wouldn't know it from the way we're actually spending our time and our money. Now, that is not the administration's fault necessarily. It's doing what it can do to get things through Congress. But if we really believe that, and I do believe that, I am far more worried about climate change and pandemics than I am about China winning something. It's not that I want China to win, but that's just not the way I think about what is going to affect my life and my children's lives. What are we doing there? How are we thinking about this investment 
to also think about all the new energy technology, all the new health technology, all the stuff that we are going to need with all the countries of the world. Because you can't just sort of say, no, we're not going to play with China or Russia or any of the others. To not to, yes, to lead, but not to win. Because nobody's going to win on these challenges. And that's the part of this conversation that is missing, and yet our own administration has said these challenges are just as existential and important to our national security as winning the technology race against China. It's funny that you say that, actually, because so many of my conversations with the White House and anyone who's really involved in this sphere, when I talk to them about the great power competition or whatever you want to call it, with China, they say it's not about China, it's about America, you know, and this is what the administration has sort of doubled down on. They don't want that to be the narrative. And yet so many of the policies, export controls and others, you know, concerns about insulating the U.S. from shocks related to blockades or embargoes of, of Taiwan, it seems like China is sort of the, um, the screensaver of this policy, <laughs> if you will. Like that's, and, and, and so I'm trying to, 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 you know, kind of dig into that a little deeper of like maybe China has the short term goal of, you know, the competition and trying to kind of dominate. But long term, what more can the administration do to then really make this about America, about, you know, getting jobs for people, uh, expanding opportunities, enhancing uh, trainings at schools and at technical institutes? I mean, Morgan, if you want to jump in there and, and, and show like, is this about America ultimately? And how do you then convey that publicly and, and show people that these are opportunities for you? It's not about China. Look, I, I think it is, it is imperative that we think at the Commerce Department and on CHIPS about strengthening our national security and doing what's good for the American people. And I think it's possible to do both. I think that is exactly what CHIPS is doing, right? We are making historic investments in American manufacturing that are going to create tens of thousands of jobs right? That is good for America. Uh, we are going to encourage the uh, awardees who, provide, who are requesting over $150 million to provide child care. We are encouraging applicants to reinvest in R&D, as we've been talking about, and to partner with universities. So all of this is fundamentally about improving the lives of everyday Americans. Um, and so I think it's possible to recognize that there is a broader competition with China while really focusing on what's good for Americans. How are we doing that on chips? We're making these historic investments, but then we also have important things like our national security guardrails. And the intent there is to make sure that the investments that we're making in America don't go to benefit potential malign actors uh, who could use the technology against us. Um, and so we really believe it's possible to do both. And, and in fact, that's, that's our job every day. And what about you know, efforts as of late to really recruit countries like the Netherlands and Japan to work with the US to maybe isolate China from access to some of these critical technologies? I, you know, how do you think that will play into what the CHIPS Act is trying to do? Well, I think with CHIPS, uh, the, the CHIPS supply chain is global. It's gonna remain global. And the reality is if we want to increase global supply chain security, which we talked about as a core goal, we're going to have to rely on our allies and partners. We're going to have to work with and coordinate with our allies and partners. Uh, and that's something that we are doing at the CHIPS program office. I actually have an international engagement team that's focused exclusively on that. Um, so I think a coordination with our allies and partners is really critical, both to strengthening our national security and increasing global supply chain security, which, as we talked about, is good for everyday Americans. I, I guess, you know, just being devil's advocate before I hand it over to the audience, um, China being China, you would think, obviously, with the competition, with a lot of the concerns about the way China uses some of these technologies, um, it would be understandable to want to work with other allies and partners. But, you know, a U.S.-China alliance in this sphere would be pretty remarkable. Are we anywhere near something like that where you could see the U.S. and China working together to enhance these supply chains to be able to really, um, you know, use this technology for the greater good? Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's a very rosy picture that I, <laughs> that I try to paint here, but. Well, I, well, I, I think going back to what Anne Marie was saying, the, the challenges we face are both geopolitical and they're transnational. And I, 
I think there was a great book written by this by you uh, a decade <laughs> ago. Um, and, and so what that means is it, we, we can't solve transnational problems alone. We, we have to do it with allies and partners. We also can't do it just through the government. It requires all sectors of society to be engaged in that. And I think that's where some of this you know, uh, disconnect, or not disconnect, but the, you know, the, the language you're seeing from the White House is trying to balance those things. And I think in an ideal world, we would get to a place with China where we could cooperate and compete. So we compete on economic and technology issues. We cooperate on transnational issues. There's, there's a way to get there. But it, it does require building trust and building trust in their technology, their supply chain, how they're using their technology, and how they use ours. Um, and that'll take time. It's not something that could be solved in years. It's something that could be solved in maybe a decade or two. Uh, but that, that's what we all need to work towards. In the meantime, I think what America has always done so well, and I would say better than anyone else in the world, is that we continually innovate on our own structures and our own ways of doing things. And the world has changed through all these new transnational issues. And so I think we need to f figure out internally what, else, what, do, what do we need to change. And just in the sector that we work in, in venture capital, venture capital has been done the same way for 30, 40 years. Uh, it was based on some interesting regulatory um, and tax changes that allowed certain structures. It has conventions that apply sort of a 10-year fund duration. Um, and those are arbitrary. There's no reason we can't change them. And as we look at the challenges we need to solve in our own technology industry, it's time we, we innovate on some of our own finance, financing structures, our workforce training structures, and that's what America does best. So I think if, if there's one thing that everybody across America could do is look at the areas that the government is shining a light on, so the semiconductor industry, the energy, climate um, sectors, and say, how can we innovate? How can we use the unique features that America has to start solving these problems? And that's our ingenuity, our capital, our talent, our universities. These are all amazing tools we have to solve these problems. Uh, and I, I'll add, on, and the care sector, right? Both Japan and France are miles ahead on robotics to help human caregivers uh, in ways that will, frankly, as I get a little older, uh, be very important for all of our lives. So it, it, we shouldn't just be thinking about uh, uh, traditional areas. I, I would add to this, though, accepting you know, we're not going to integrate our supply lines with China. Uh, that, that's not going to happen, certainly not now. However, we could do a lot better if we were willing to lead a different way. If you really want to bring China to the table, we can't launch the initiative. The EU has to la launch the initiative. And in many of these areas, the EU is not ahead of us technologically, but they are ahead of us as the regulators. Mm -hmm. So if we're thinking about just right now, we haven't talked about AI yet and the impact of AI on all of this and whether these, uh, you know, how much of these, these jobs will be then affected by AI. But we need global rules of the road for AI the way we, need, we needed them for nukes. They, I, AI and nuclear weapons are not the same in many, many, many ways. But the one way I think they are is you need some real global rules of the road, and they have to be global. global. We'll call a conference. China's not coming. If the EU calls a conference, they've got a far better shot. They're China's biggest trading partner, and China wants Europe. Uh, and wants to peel Europe away from us. I don't think that's going to happen, but we should actually look at both Europe and ASEAN as the places that can bring China and us to the table and others in ways that would get us there. But that goes against our DNA, right? We're back. We're at the table. We're the convener. We're the indispensable nation. We're not going to get where we need to get on the transnational issues and on w those areas where we really do need global cooperation if we insist on being the out front leader. We can lead from the center. We can lead uh, with our allies. But we've got to let other people put their, 